welcome to My Art Breaker Talks. I'm your host, Charlotte Stewart, and today is another in the episode series of talks where we are talking about art and technology and the innovators in the market at the moment. Our guest today is Akul, and we're very, very lucky to be joined by their CEO, Bernadine. Bernadine, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. So, a business building digital infrastructure in the art world. Tell us, break that down for us, Bernadine. Tell us what our cool does and who it's for. Yeah, absolutely. Infrastructure is a funny word, right? Because it, it, people love using that term in technology, like we're building infrastructure. Yeah. But um, in the case of the art industry, I think it really is something that is needed in terms of facilitating sales of art and authentication of art. What Arkle does is it creates authenticity and traceability and um, streamlines the process of purchasing a work of art. Um, and there are lots of sophisticated technological tools that we use to ensure that that is happening, but we're, we're, we're focusing on that at the end of the day. Um, so more concretely, we have a product for galleries to be able to sell artworks to collectors with um, a digital dossier, which is like a uh, folder of digital files that are authenticated and timestamped at the point of purchase. And within that digital dossier, you can also include things such as um, resale royalties for artists, um, further information about exhibition history of the artwork, all kinds of, um, all kinds of digital files that are then transferred over to the new owner um, at the point of purchase. And um, a second example of what we did is um, our payout functionality was used for access by Art Basel that was just um, delivered in Miami last uh, December. And that was a curated sale put on during the art fair. The works were physically at the fair, but when collectors um, made an offer to purchase the work, 10% was uh, pledged to charity and the collector could decide to increase their pledge to charity with their offer. So um, it was automatically 10%, but they could increase above 10%. And uh, we and facilitated all that payment in the background. And of course, something like that would have been a much more laborious process for an event to do. So. So we were talking about this a little bit just before the pod. Can you, um, you often, you're actually the infrastructure that's behind, you know, white labeled into galleries, aren't you? Which other than Art Basel, who else uses your infrastructure um, to facilitate? Yeah. So, so we, interestingly, it's, it's expanding. So we started off just working with Art Basel galleries. Um, so it was a very curated group and um, we had quite a, a public uh, exhibition that really, said we're using Arquil with Von Bartha last year, um, uh, an artist called Athena Galiciades. All the works that were sold during that exhibition were authenticated on the Arquil blockchain. We have about uh, 45 more galleries that have been using it in 2023 um, from the Art Basel ecosystem. And then the, um, the, the slowly but surely it's developing that more and more people are using it. So um, we've been expanding to be able to support non-Art Basel galleries. And now we are also um, supporting artist studios. So we've been having more and more artist studios use the software as well. And um, following our collaboration with Art Basel, we're working also with some art fairs. So it's, it's kind of anyone that is working on uh, delivering a digital or hybrid experience of purchasing art and wants to have that kind of streamlined payment and authentication process, they come to us. Mm -hmm. um, how long have you been going? Yeah, it's a company that's been founded by the parent company of Art Basel, MCH Group in Switzerland, together with the Luma Foundation, which is a nonprofit also in Switzerland, and Boston Consulting Group, the big uh, American uh, partnership. And it's been in development for uh, since about 2018. So that's mm -hmm. a long time that it's been in development. But actually live in the market, it went live just over a year ago at Miami um, 2022. I mean, that's really how long it takes to create a product like this. Because as from my, from my understanding is there's, there's an awful lot, and we'll go into those in a bit more detail in a second, there's an awful lot of different technologies needed in order to 
to streamline the processes that so many, you know, I imagine a lot of smaller galleries, it's a huge friction point is actually just the processes and efficiencies of of moving money and art and um, ownership through. Um, what's your background, Bernadine? How did you come into this space? And is it something that you were really frustrated about? How did that happen? So it's a it's it's a wonderful question. I started at Arquil, um nearly two years ago. And I was working in the art and technology space, running my own company for 10 years. That was uh, an online platform connecting collectors, exhibition producers, and museums for temporary and touring exhibitions, mm -hmm. uh, particularly museum shows. So I do have a background in kind of understanding how long it takes for um, a more paper-based industry to be thinking about using digital tools. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, I, I, I was approached about this role and... It's, it's quite in my area of expertise in terms of art, technology, understanding how to convince people to, to use something, that it fits within the way that they work rather than being something completely disruptive. It's, it's been a really interesting journey because you join a company that's been in development. So when I joined, there were uh, 40 Boston Consulting Group consultants working on it. And we hired the whole full-time team that is now running the, the, the company. And so I think it's, um, as you said, this takes time. It's not something that like most startups, you, you, you bootstrap, you get some investment from some VCs, you scale it up, et cetera. When you're talking about payment money flows, legal contracts of authenticity, resale royalties. These are things that require a lot of research, a lot of um, smart minds thinking about how to make it work in order for it to actually, to not just be talking the talk, but actually walking the walk of being able to do it. Mm -hmm. And so just take us through the difference. We talked about digital, so digital dossier, is that the blockchain piece of the, of the technology? Yeah, we're actually going to be um, publishing more information about how this works from a blockchain point of view. We have a fantastic team of engineers that are working on all of the um, blockchain related features that we're developing. I guess if you are in that blockchain space, you'll know that a normal NFT only holds a certain amount of metadata. So it's quite a small file um, that gets stored on the blockchain with potentially a link to an external file on IPFS or wherever it might be. And what the digital dossier does is it's actually a token of tokens. <laughs> so it's almost like you can put all of these files together into one token that then can be transferred with a blockchain transaction. And those tokens can include uh, smart contracts, which are basically automatically executed depending on whether certain criteria are met. So it's great to have an example when you tell, talk about these things. If you purchase something and it has a digital dossier attached to it, and within the digital dossier, there is a confidential contract between the artist and the gallery that when the artwork is purchased, the money that's used will be split 50-50 between the artist and the gallery, the smart contract will automatically pay out that, yeah, according to those terms that were predefined. So you don't have to go back and have one person receive the money, then transfer it again to someone else, et cetera. It happens automatically. Um, it sounds so simple, but it's actually quite complicated to make it happen. So that's that's one part of the business. Um, when it comes to payment solutions, what, what's in that tech ecosystem there for galleries? So usually blockchain-based solutions use cryptocurrency, but we don't. We use actual fiat currency. So we're creating the technology to be able to have smart contracts that um, say this money needs to go here or here, but then integrate into the payment rails that the galleries are already used to using. Um, so if you make a bank transfer or if you make a credit card payment, it then follows the logic of that smart contract. And what do galleries who don't work with you, how do they take this on? Uh, you know, because we've seen we've seen a lot of people move into crypto payment, you know, even auction houses during yeah. the NFT boom. Um, and 
you know, I did wonder about the infrastructure that was put in place very quickly, you know, during that time. It needed to happen. But what what are people currently doing who don't have the solution of of our cool to to build it for them? Um, so how do you normally invoice a, a collector, right? Well, we've, we've been doing extensive research with the galleries to find out how they work and what they do. And um, the truth is it is a pain point, um, both for the galleries and for the collectors who are purchasing the works and for the artists who receive the payments out from the, from the whole thing. It's, it's, it's complicated. So galleries want to invoice the client as soon as possible. And that invoice actually acts not just as a uh, request for payment, but it includes the terms of the agreement. So it includes all of the information about the legal agreement that that collector is going into. And often it even acts as a kind of certificate of authenticity too, because the, the collector will in the future use that invoice to prove that that is an, a real object, right? So mm -hmm. I'm in the most traditional sense of the word, a, collect, a, a gallery would be using paper invoicing, just um, sending an invoice or creating a PDF and sending it via email and then requesting the payment from the collector. The collector makes the payment, then whoever's doing the bookkeeping at the gallery has to check whether, like match that payment with that invoice and make sure that they know that it's been paid. Then also match any costs that have been prepaid for that artwork so if, for example, they've paid for manufacturing of that artwork or making sure that the all of the agreements that they have with the artist are being upheld and then pay out the artist based on whatever the, uh, the, the, the agreement is. So that's how galleries do it currently. And what we do is we make it possible for that to be happening, happening automatically. And because it's all on a, a digital ledger, you know, OK, this has been paid this person has been paid, uh, we still need to deal with these issues, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've covered payment and we've covered really what we're talking about there is is, is a paper trail, like a digital paper trail for an artwork. What else is in the is in the Arcool um, hat trick of technology? So one of the newer features that we're that we've been rolling out is like a shop front, but it's not quite a shop front because it's not we're not an e-commerce platform it's just a way to showcase artworks beautifully so that then someone can decide okay this is the one i want and then and then purchase it the reason i'm very careful with the word shop front is because art is not purchased the way that you would buy uh, uh, anything a, a, a piece of uh, clothing or uh, something on Amazon it's not the same it's an experience and there are lots of different things that go into it so we are digitizing that kind of experience so that then it's likely that the person will convert and pay so if you think about it we do everything at the end when it comes to payments and we're slowly coming forward to what galleries are asking us to to, to build for them, but I, I, don't get me wrong. There's not we're not making any websites for galleries or anything like that. It's simply that experience, that conversation between mm -hmm. a gallery and a collector when the work is going to be purchased, and what do you digitally want to happen to then mm -hmm. make them feel happy to purchase that work. And mm -hmm. on the other side, for the collector, that they can receive an email. Um, go through some steps to verify their identity and, and find out what they need to do to pay so that they can then um, seamlessly get the artwork. And they receive information about what they've paid for immediately. So they'll receive that digital dossier, uh, that information about the artwork and know that it's been paid. But then they can, ha the, the work then actually gets shipped and all of the things that happen after that. Mm -hmm. It feels like... Um... It feels like at some point in Arkul's conceptualization, somebody went, what are all the pain points with the current art market for potentially smaller galleries, right? That don't necessarily have this inbuilt um, infrastructure. You know, we, we have, you know, as you're talking, I'm thinking about all the constraints we have as a business. You know, like we, you know, I'm like, well, we do this. This is how we got around that. We built, you know, we've built a lot of technology ourselves because there wasn't something out there in the market. Is um is, is that the case? Is it a case of 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 sort of um diagnosing the market's pain points and having a solution, you know, and also I imagine that's grown massively in the last three years. It's interesting 
how those pain points might have changed over the course of COVID and, and the online art market becoming more common. Yeah, I think you can probably tell that this is a project that's been developing over many years, right? With many, many minds of people that have been thinking about it and thinking about how to improve it. And uh, that's why it's sometimes hard to put it into just a one-liner, right? Because it's just developing together with the with the galleries and the artists that we're working with and, 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 and building what they need. Um, what you're saying about whether it's the smaller or the larger galleries, I think it we're working with some of the larger galleries like the Art Basel galleries that we worked with at, um, uh, in Miami. I mean, that included people like Hauser and Worth, um, Pace Gallery, Lehman Maupin, Luring Augustine, a lot of the larger galleries. Um, they, the, the, what we learned is that in order to be used, at the end of the day, we want to be something that's used by all of the galleries or by a lot of them. And in order for that to happen, we need to be flexible. So we need to be able to um, work with other systems. We need to be able to work in the way that the gallery does, in the way that they prefer to, 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 to use the tool. And so we've adjusted from maybe a more, uh, yeah, I guess when you're building software, you would love it if it was just like this, then that, then that, then that. And the reality is that in the art industry, it's often like a bit fluid like if the collector is from here then we need to go this way but if the collector is from here we need yep. to go this way and all Our of market, those things i would say a market of variables is the one thing <laughs> exactly exactly so we've been mapping out those variables and creating kind of the, uh, the a system that can work in the way that the gallery does now where we add the most value you're probably right it's probably with galleries that haven't built software themselves for this and don't necessarily have a full-time person working on it, et cetera. However, we have worked with a lot of these other galleries and they'll use us for different reasons. So maybe there is something where an, an artist really wants the collector to receive a manual with the artwork about how it should be installed and shown. That can be put into the digital dossier. So you actually have like a safe place for that information to be stored. So the collector can always reference back to it and see what it is. It could be that a gallery says, oh, I really want to know that my artist has received their funds from the purchase at the point that we sell it to the collector. So we call that internally in immediate artist payout. But basically, like I want to make sure that the artist is paid immediately. We can facilitate that. We can also facilitate if they say we want to um, receive the money in this currency, but we want the payout to be in this currency. Mm -hmm. We can do that kind of currency exchange and figure out what works better for them. So there's lots of different reasons that someone might say this software is really helping me in my business. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, there's some buzzwords in there of like blockchain and uh, all of these types of things. But I, I, I like to focus on the actual problems at hand that we're solving rather mm -hmm. than what the technology is that's helping solve those problems. Mm -hmm. What's been the biggest challenge of all the um, areas that you're trying to conquer? What's been the hardest? What perhaps has the most variables that you haven't been able to solve? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 yeah. Um, well, I guess the first thing to say is that the art industry for an industry that works with some of the most forward thinking minds and is always working with the avant-garde, actually, they're not early adopters of technology. <laughs> and I think that that it might be because exactly because of the fact that artists are you never know what they're going to actually produce and like it's all uncertainty there's a lot of uncertainty in everything that then if with all of that uncertainty you kind of want to have certainty in your infrastructure like you don't want to mess with the things that you kind of can be sure of like a pdf is a pdf i know what it is i know how it works i'm not going to change it um perhaps that's why but basically the art industry doesn't necessarily like technology so that is already one of the the, the struggles but I think that um, what our team is working on at the moment and, and, and uh, is still an ongoing concern is privacy and understanding what information people want to share, what information they don't want to share. And having that same flexible approach about how you approach privacy um, 
that we've had with other features within our product and making sure that we are following the way that the, the industry wants us to work. Because it's fascinating. Like some, some people want you to know that they purchased this work. Some people don't even want the gallery to know who they are when they purchase the work. So there's so much, um, there are so many layers to this. And one of the reasons that we are quite a complicated technology product is because we're tackling that privacy concern ourselves. So we're ensuring that you know, that you have immutable proof of what has happened without necessarily needing to disclose the details of that transaction. Mm -hmm. That uh, I'll, I'll say that again. So we're working on making sure you have immutable proof that something has happened without needing to see the details of what has happened. Yeah, and which, that is, is, which is a really impossible thing to do. I mean, even in, <laughs> we don't, we, we um, you know, we come across obviously authenticity in our world with prints and multiples and the artists that we trade. Um, is one of the biggest challenges. Um, and, um, you know, paperwork is not, you know, oh, I've got all the paperwork, doesn't necessarily you've got to mean you've got all the paperwork. And there's always a break in that chain. There's a lot of really interesting um, companies who are looking to create these sort of digital um, dossiers, for want of a various expressions that you can call them, um, which work really well in the primary market with big emerging artists. You know, if the if you can get the artist on early enough to go, this is really important for my artist resale rights, let alone my legacy. Um, where I'm still skeptical is in the secondary market where you have, you know, we don't work with artists, you know, pre 150 years ago, but I mean, you know, but I've, but we've already got, you know, things don't, unfortunately, a lot of artists weren't known to be somebody, somebody needs to um, create a paper trail for. So how do you, is there anything that you're doing at the moment that can actually look back at an artwork's history and digitalize it? Um, nothing that we can announce yet, but yes. And uh, we, there's a reason that we started with a product that is for living artists and galleries, because exactly what you're describing, like it's the place where it's the simplest. Um, simplest it's still not straightforward to get an artist to sign things off and to be happy and to all of that is still a lot of work but it's it's straightforward in understanding that this is the artwork the artist has produced and it really is what it says it is um our approach to that is probably more about the authenticity of the information rather than the authenticity of the artwork itself and um having kind of information be verified by people uh, and I know that there are quite a lot of people in the industry that think similarly about um, about this. There's even um, kind of like working group of a lot of art companies together called the Art, Identifi art Identification Standard, where um, a lot of companies are having conversations about an approach to authenticity and, 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 and identifying works of art. But yeah, when you were talking, I was just thinking about also, I, I worked at a gallery way back when and whenever you had a secondary market work come into the gallery with a thick dossier it actually was more of a red flag than a, a, a comforting thing um a lot of the time because you can pay for lots of research to be done on a work that is inauthentic and um i think that is that is the issue with 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 a lot of these proposals that uh, um yeah i mean i think it's um it's it goes back to your very very good point around you know the art market having a real problem with turn you know digitalizing itself and and particularly I think leaders in particular spheres of the art market who are not up for for moving on with technology I mean it's so at all the galleries we talk to all of the interviews we have with galleries is like in order for this to really work you have to have the big players in the secondary market agreeing to it and working on it. And so okay. what we've been working on is kind of thinking about how do you bring them into the ecosystem? And again, I think that with our backers, it helps us in terms of building that trust with some of the larger players and making sure that things are working. But also I think that it's got to do with um, kind of understanding that we are, we don't need to be the star of the show. Like we're very much, a background like uh, I always say like we're the supporting act like everyone else can be the 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 
the primary like protagonist of their of their business and we'll just support to make sure that it works and i think that that is probably the essence of our approach is like maybe sometimes you won't even notice that you're using arcule when you're buying something or that you that you actually um and ideally you shouldn't, right? Because it should be such a seamless process. You shouldn't notice. And the problem is, is that it's always the thing that, you know, the you, you go through this wonderful process of, of purchasing an artwork and you fall in love with it. And then there's a price to be negotiated, which, you know, can be tough and some people go the wrong way, but actually it's quite exciting. It's quite exciting when you're buying an artwork at a certain level. And it's always the it's always the, you know, the really boring back office stuff that really taints the experience of buying the artwork. So, and in theory, you should go unnoticed, right? Because it's it's seamless. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there, but again, there are many very valid reasons why it is painful, and there is a reason why. There, so there are regulatory reasons, there are uh, tax compliance reasons, there's all kinds of very boring stuff that you need to be thinking about in order for this to work properly. And so I think that um, a lot of it is about making sure that we, yeah, we, we work in a way that is compliant, in a way that is like following all of the, 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 the way that it should work, but makes it continue it makes that does that like that beautiful experience that you were exp explaining of like I fall in love with the work I want to purchase it let's make sure that it goes all the way through rather than waiting a month for an invoice and then waiting and all of these types of things it's just not not ideal mm -hmm. and um I think that one other thing is that the industry we don't like to talk about our pains. We don't like to talk about things that don't go well because we want everyone to feel like, yes, I love purchasing art. It's such a wonderful experience and everyone does it really well and all of that. So we're, we also have to be careful to kind of be like, we're helping, but there, not that there's really that much of a problem here because I think that it, it, people don't like talking about that, that, like airing their dirty laundry or, or, or anything like that. So it's, it's, yeah, it's about slowly but surely getting things uh, moving in a different direction. Mm -hmm. Technology on itself is not a solution. Um, so whatever we build will follow the legal guidelines of what has been said. Mm -hmm. But what it what, what block, blockchain does do is it tells you what were the facts at the time of that specific situation. So at that time, this was agreed into, or at that time, this was the information that was shared. Can mm. that information change over time? Of course, but you have a record that shows exactly what it was at that time. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just the secondary market, isn't it? Which is, you know, people talk about transparency in, in the art market and, and then people come up with solutions and you're like, well, that's great, but does that work for an artwork of 250 years old? Um, so just, I really liked that that question that you posed earlier. Why do you think the art world is, you know, I gave my answer to it perhaps um, or alluded to it, but why do you think the art market in particular has such a love it, hate it relationship with technology? Oh, I, I have so many answers to that question. <laughs> um, no, I think, I think there are many different reasons. I'll go really basic to start with. Um, databases when they first started were very difficult to search for information, etc. And because the art market has so many different types of information, databases were created in such a complex way. Like you had to put the length in one field, the width in one field, and the date in one field. And like basically a lot of people, their bane of their existence was making sure databases were correct. And like, so basically just from there already, there was like a little bit of a bad rep, like, oh my gosh, I have to use something on FileMaker Pro and make sure that it's not incorrect. Or like this spreadsheet never actually works. So I think there's like a bit of like that, that, that annoyance that is still there from like a long time ago with a lot of people that like technology just doesn't work for art. Like it just, it's, it's just not, 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 not helpful. Um, so that's one. And I, I, that I can go back to when I was working with museums, like there's just this feeling that it's like, it makes things more cumbersome rather than less. 
Um, so I think that's one. I think that there also has been a lot of technology claiming to solve a problem that is not solvable through technology. So I think that there are lots of people with great ideas that then come and like, it's super inspiring when you hear it and it's really great, but actually you need more like than what? just technology. Like, like what, Bernadine? What can't be solved with technology? <laughs> what can't be solved with technology? I think, um, oh gosh, I'm going to give lots of examples that then I'm going to have people saying, no, you can't solve that with technology. Uh, okay, maybe let's say with technology thus far. Maybe that's the, the, the right way to say it. So um, replacing the experience of viewing an artwork in person um, and yeah. like falling in love with it. I know one founder that would disagree with you already. Yeah. Exactly. I have the voices in my head of the people who will disagree. And I can disagree with myself because I've purchased digital art, right? And I've I've um, fallen in love with the work of digital artists without seeing it in person. So I, I, I can completely disprove myself, but I do think that probably maybe the point to be made is that there are certain things in the art world that are lovely because they're not digital and we don't need to digitize them. But then there are some things that actually are not so lovely because they're not digital and we should digitize them. So mm -hmm. I think maybe that's that's it. And then in the art industry, people kind of like paint everything with a broad brush. Like, I don't like it, let's just not. And then there's this weird thing of this othering of um, digital that I don't know where it comes from, but there's like, NFT artists were kind of put in their own thing, which was the same thing as how new media artists were considered before that. Like, it, it's just like there's othering of if you're not using a brush and you're using some form of digital tool, it's some other thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's shifting, but it, it definitely was there for quite some time and it, it's, it's, it's quite surprising. So yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, why? Uh, then, then I gave you my 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 reason that is probably the one that I'll I'll, I'll 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 stick to is that everything else is so uncertain in the art industry that kind of changing processes, whether that's digital or anything else, just changing the way that you work with a different way of working feels risky, and like you're not sure who's going to buy your next artwork. Then why would you want to be risking? like using a different system to get the money or to get the, um, to, 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 to showcase the work or whatever. But I think, yeah, it, 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 it's not that the art industry doesn't innovate because if you look at how the art industry works today compared to 10 years ago or 20 years ago, it has changed, but it just takes a long time for people to change in that like curve of adoption. The mm -hmm. art industry is not in the early adopter category a lot of the time, or rather, some parts of the art industry are not in the early adopter category. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Bernadine. It's been fascinating. Likewise. Thank you so much for having me.